after the Second World War, uh, many Latin American countries chose the policy of what came to be known as import substitution, industrialization, as the, the strategies for economic development. Uh, this was really a strategy which you could call anti-globalization, because basically what the Latin American uh, countries wanted to do, especially the larger Latin American countries, uh, they wanted to, uh, uh, to diversify their economies. Uh, they came out of the 19th century and into the 20th century in a globalized world, a different type of globalized world than what we have today. Uh, the second half of the 19th century uh, was a, a century of uh, tremendous expansion of international trade. Uh, international trade in which Latin America and many other what we call today third world countries were involved and uh, uh, in which they participated as exporters of what we call primary goods, namely uh, minerals and, uh, uh, and food products. Uh, so gradually, many of these economies, many of these countries, uh, really concentrated on the exportation of just maybe one or two of those products. Uh, uh, for example, 90% uh, uh, of the export earnings of Chile consisted of copper, basically. Uh, uh, close to 90% of uh, Brazil's earnings consisted of the exportation of coffee and some sugar and some cotton, and so on and so forth. So in other words, all these economies were uh, completely specialized in exporting what we call primary products to the industrialized countries of the world, and the industrialized countries of the world uh, would then export manufactured products to uh, the Latin American countries and to also countries in Africa and Asia. Uh, and this was thought to be correct. This was thought to be the result of, uh, uh, of market forces, a globalized world in which market forces would determine who would specialize in what, and the Latin American countries had a supposedly a comparative advantage in, uh, uh, in producing and exporting coffee and sugar, and, uh, uh, and that was all, all to the good of the world. Uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, two thing comments uh, that I'd like to make on this. Number one, uh, uh, was this really the result of market forces? And number two, wasn't this really the result of colonialism? We, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the world in the late 19th century was being colonized, especially in Africa and Asia, uh, by uh, Britain and France, uh, Portugal, uh, Holland, and so on and so forth. And so quite a number of historians would say that no, the uh, d division of labor between those countries and the industrializing countries re was really enforced by the colonial powers, getting cheap raw materials and a ready-made market for their products. As far as Latin America is concerned, uh, most Latin American countries were independent uh, since the 1820s, but what happens there was that uh, the British guaranteed the independence of many Latin American countries uh, against Spain and they wanted a quid pro quo uh, for their guarantees. And a quid pro quo was a, uh, a, sp a special uh, uh, advantages in selling their goods, uh, uh, their manufactured goods in Latin America, which prevented Latin America really from industrializing throughout most of the 19th century. Uh, but the unease with this sort of globalization uh, that you had in Latin America was basically a, uh, 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 the following. Uh, if a country, uh, the typical Latin American country depended on just one or two food products or raw materials to earn foreign exchange, then they were totally dependent of what happened in the advanced industrialized uh, part of the world. Uh, and as the industrialized world was experiencing regular business cycles, uh, uh, alteration between the prosperity and depression, uh, whenever there was a depression and the demand for the raw materials went down and the prices of these raw materials and food products went down, there was nothing the Latin American countries could do. They were totally dependent on the exports of just a small number of primary products. The only thing they could do is go to church and pray and hope that the, the depression in the advanced industrial countries would be over and the demand for their exports would uh, once again uh, raise the prices and the export earnings would increase. That's what was called dependency. And that was increasingly resented uh, in many Latin American countries, especially when you came to the, uh, into the 20th century. And so, uh, in the 20th century, uh, many Latin American countries decided, especially after the Second World War, that the only way really to get around this, this dependency would be to diversify their economies. Uh, 
And you could diversify the economies by uh, emphasizing industrialization. And how do you uh, achieve industrialization? Well, by basically uh, in engaging in import substitution. Import substitution would be the following. You raise tariffs to uh, very high levels and or uh, you block imports uh, in order to uh, generate a domestic substitute. Uh, and this is precisely uh, the policies that countries like Mexico and Brazil and Argentina and Chile and others uh, followed uh, in the 19, uh, 1950s and 1960s. Uh, the, uh, 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 so basically, what were the policies? The policies I just mentioned was high level of protection. Uh, protection to stimulate the, uh, uh, the, the production of all sorts of manufactured products. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the Latin Americans realized that they needed, uh, they didn't have the technology, they didn't have the means to establish import substituting industries, especially in the automobile industry, uh, or the, uh, 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 the manufacture of all sorts of consumer durables, of, of television sets, of uh, washing machines, and so on and so forth. So basically, they invited multinationals to set up production facilities in their countries. Uh, the, uh, uh, so that was a very important uh, aspect of the development strategy uh, uh, that they followed. They needed uh, foreign firms to come in uh, to produce manufactured products. They could have maybe uh, slowly developed the, uh, their own industries, but that would have taken too much time. They'd rather wanted a multinational with all the experience that is needed, not only to manufacture an automobile, but to know how the layout of a plant, knowing how much to outsource, how much to produce domestically, how to organize uh, uh, the marketing facilities, and so on and so forth. That's all part of technology. Uh, so uh, that was the idea. We'll bring in the multinationals. And what would attract the multinationals? Well, well you would tell the multinationals, Volkswagen, General Motors from here, or Ford, uh, if you want to participate in the Brazilian market in the future, you better set up production facilities uh, in our market, otherwise you'll be left out. And that was a very important stimulant for, uh, for many multinationals to set up uh, 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 their production facilities in various Latin American countries. Uh, in addition to this, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, there was no ideology of where you should have private enterprise and where you should have state enterprise. The Latin Americans were pragmatic, uh, and their pragmatism led them to start state enterprises to uh, establish facilities in areas where the private sector, domestic or foreign, weren't interested in uh, making investments, like steel industry. Uh, the Brazilians and Mexicans were interested not only in the assembly plant, but to, to produce uh, uh, 70 or 80 percent of the value add of an automobile within Brazil or within uh, Argentina uh, or, or within Mexico. And for that, you needed a steel industry. Uh, well, if the foreigners didn't want to do it, and if the domestic pri uh, private sector didn't have the means to do it, we'll set up a, uh, a state enterprise. So a state enterprise in steel uh, was established, state enterprises all over Latin America. The same thing was true in, uh, in the area of oil exploration. There was a little nationalism involved in that. Uh, 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 more and more uh, uh, of the, uh, the producers of petroleum uh, fell into the hands of uh, state enterprises. Uh, because it was felt that uh, uh, minerals and oil was a non-replaceable uh, resource and that ought to be in the hands of a domestic entity. Uh, that's why in Mexico, later on Brazil, uh, Venezuela, all over the place, the oil industry uh, 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 fell into the hands of state enterprises who then expanded later on with the industrialization into petrochemicals, etc., etc. Finally, uh, most of the countries also, they didn't have a capital market and if you industrialize you needed a uh, uh, long-term capital, but if you don't have a capital market, uh, uh, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative was for the state to set up development banks. Development banks would, which would give long-term loans to both the private and the public sector. Uh, well, there were many other aspects of the policies, and I don't want to go into too many details because that is not the idea of, uh, of this presentation, uh, but the net result of these efforts, and I'm talking about the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, was that in most Latin American countries, you had a high r uh, rate of economic growth, but the locomotive for this growth was the, in uh, the industry. Industry, rather than the primary export sector, was what uh, resulted in substantial, uh, substantial high growth rate. And you had a tremendous uh, uh, a ch a change in the structure of the economies. Instead of agriculture being the main contributor to the GDP, industry came to dominate agriculture. 
Uh, so that was a great success story. And let me just, uh, by the way, get away from my uh, outline. Uh, just, uh, the first time I ever came to Latin America was after this period of import substitution. But the first time I remember that I was in Brazil, uh, it was very interesting. Some of my early friends uh, always pointed out to me, oh, do you see that Ford car? We didn't import it, we made it. Uh, do you see that, uh, uh, that television set, GE television set? We didn't import it, we made it. There was a tremendous pride that we Latins can also make sophisticated goods rather than just cutting sugar cane or picking coffee of the coffee trees. Uh, so that is a, a sort of an impact that very few people uh, uh, appreciate nowadays. Very few authors place in their textbook, but I just want to mention this personal aspect uh, which was very important from the Latin American point of view. Now those were sort of the, the, the positive aspects of it. Uh, but uh, import substitution produced a number of problems. Uh, the most interesting problem, uh, which has something to do with the, some, the, the theme of my lecture here, uh, was that uh, uh, there's been, there had been an overemphasis on import substitution. Uh, whatever you could produce in Brazil or in Mexico, uh, the Mexicans and Brazilians decided, will we'll promote. We'll produce automobiles, we'll produce ships, we'll produce television sets, we'll pr whatever manufactured goods could be produced, will promote it, will have a high enough tariff to give an incentive to multinationals to come in and set up production facilities. Uh, there was no, uh, so the whole idea of globalization, which means free trade, in which there would be specialization according to what we economists call comparative advantage, that was totally disregarded. The idea basically was almost stop the world, I want to get off. Uh, uh, the idea was to, uh, to maximize the decline in what we economists call the import coefficient. What is the import coefficient? It's the ratio of imports to GDP, gross domestic product. The value of imports divided by GDP. The more you could squeeze this, the more independent we'll be, uh, the more diversified our economy, and bye-bye the world that was exploiting us in the past. Uh, well, uh, that worked for a while, but it didn't really uh, work at all. Because for a while, this import coefficient declined, but after a while, lo and behold, it began to rise again. And that was uh, uh, caught everybody by surprise in Latin America. Why is the import coefficient, the ratio of imports to GDP, rising again? We were, we were working towards making our country economically independent from the international uh, uh, community. Uh, which had been exploiting us. Well, what, basically what was happening, if you examine the, uh, the, the contents of imports, was the Latin Americans were importing less cars. They were importing less television sets. They were importing less uh, washing machines. But they were import importing more and more capital goods, more and more sophisticated components, and more and more raw materials that they didn't produce themselves. Uh, Brazil at the time uh, depended to the extent of 80% of its uh, uh, petroleum on imported petroleum. And the more you industrialize, the more you needed uh, uh, petroleum. So basically what was happening is that the, uh, for the new manufacturing sector to function, you were dependent on more and more imports. Uh, the uh, imports of what we call imported inputs into industry. Now, uh, that, but now what is very interesting by the time you get to the 1960s or 70s, once it was realized uh, that you couldn't say to the world economy, bye bye, I want to get off, we're becoming totally uh, in independent of the rest of the world, uh, when it became obvious that it was necessary to, uh, to import these imported inputs into the new industrial sector, then suddenly the Latin Americans became to realize, uh-uh, uh, there's something wrong. And what was wrong? Well, if you looked at the export uh, uh, structure of Brazil, after 30 years of industrialization, uh, you'd never suspect, looking at the export, uh, the, uh, the uh, commodity composition of their exports, you'd never would suspect that they, uh, uh, they had industrialized. Because by the time you get to the mid-1960s, still 90% of their export earnings came from the traditional products, coffee, sugar, cocoa, uh, because export had been neglected. And now the Latin Americans found themselves in a very difficult position. If you still depend on your traditional exports to earn foreign exchange, to pay for uh, these imported inputs. And suppose now the price of coffee declines. Suppose that the price of sugar uh, uh, declines uh, and your foreign exchange earnings declines. How are you going to pay for the imported machinery, for the imported petroleum, for the imported coal? For example, Brazil had a steel industry, had excellent iron ore, but no coke, uh, no, uh, no coal for coking. Uh, no uh, good coal for coking. So you had to import the, uh, the coke. Uh, 
so uh, uh, you were in a dilemma. And at that point, at that point, uh, the more conservative economists uh, had a field day. They say, aha, you idiots. Uh, you didn't even look at potential comparative advantage. You, m you had to have your automobile industry and your uh, steel industry and everything else, and now you're in a dilemma. You need to generate more export earnings, but, uh, but what sort of industries do you have? You have industries that grew up before, uh, behind a huge tariff wall. They were very inefficient. There was no competition. Uh, the quality wasn't as, uh, what was needed in, the, in international competition. And now you want to, uh, you need to import non-traditional products. But what are you going to, uh, you need to export non-traditional products. But what are you going to export? What's going to be competitive in the market? Uh, so then uh, the, uh, the, the conservative economist says, aha, we could have told you. You've forgotten all about comparative advantage. Why weren't you more modest? Uh, why weren't you modest and why didn't you uh, try to export, uh, to industrialize according to uh, uh, lines of where you had a, great, uh, a greater com uh, potential comparative advantage? Couldn't you just have promoted the textile industry, the shoe industry, the bicycle industry, and forget about automobiles and forget about steel industry and so on? Uh, would not have made more sense. And you could have exported those products to Europe and the United States, and with foreign exchange earnings, you could have then imported all these other uh, heavy manufactured goods. Uh, that's a, a good criticism, except for one thing. Had Brazil or Mexico specialized only in textile through, uh, through industrialization, only in shoes, uh, exporting them to earn foreign exchange to Europe or the United States, what guarantee was that at the time that the United States would have said, okay, we'll sacrifice our textile industry. We'll wipe it out. Uh, we'll import it from Brazil and Mexico and so on. Okay, we'll wipe out our uh, shoe industry in Europe. Uh, we'll just uh, import Brazilian or Mexican shoes and so on. Well, as we all know, those traditional industries in the United States and in Europe are extremely protectionist. Uh, the, uh, even under the, drive, the free trade drive, uh, that occurred uh, in, in the years after the Second World War, uh, the, uh, those industries, traditional industries in the United States uh, uh, and Europe, insisted on special treatment uh, against the competition of foreign goods. So it, seems, uh, it would seem that the, that the Latin Americans, uh, they had no choice but to industrialize across the board. And what I tell many of my students when I tell them about comparative advantage and the story there is if you believe in comparative advantage, then it takes two to play the game of comparative advantage, like it takes two to tango. Uh, in other words, uh, you can't expect the Latins to behave well and uh, the people in the North, the United States and Western Europe uh, to disregard it, to protect their traditional industries. Uh, by the way, this is one bone of contention often between Latin America and the United States. We are very preachy. We tell them what to do, how to behave according to the market, to be less protectionist, when we do exactly the opposite on our own. And you don't know how, uh, how badly this goes over in Latin America. They call us a bunch of hypocrites. Do as I do, don't, no, do as I say, don't do as I do, so to speak. Uh, well, anyway. That's the, the story of import substitution industrialization and its problems, the anti-globalization uh, 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 era of the time, where the Latin Americans were forced to become maybe be aware of being more globalized, of exporting non-traditional products uh, by the time you get to the 1970s. Uh, the, uh, then uh, uh, when, when, when the Latin Americans began to be aware of this and try to export non-traditional product, uh, something else happened in the world, and that something else was in the 1970s when OPEC started to uh, function. Not to start to function, but started to use its muscle. And in late 1973 and, er and early 1974, OPEC, as many of you may know, quadrupled the price of oil. Uh, with the quadrupling of uh, the price of oil, countries like, uh, like Brazil were in a very difficult position because Brazil was importing over 80% of its oil needs. Now, with a quadrupling of the price of oil, uh, it wasn't a dilemma. If you now you're going to pay for the oil, then you're not going to have enough foreign exchange left to, uh, to pay for the coal you have to import, for the mach uh, machine, uh, the, the components you have to import. In other words, you'd have to substantially uh, decrease uh, the rate of growth of the country just to pay for the oil. Well, Brazil at that time, I'm just uh, uh, pointing out Brazil, a number of countries were in the same uh, situation. They said, no, we, we, uh, uh, we can't do this. We must continue to grow. As a matter of fact, in the 1970s, when this occurred, with the quadrupling of the price of oil, Brazil was beginning 
uh, to lead the country away from a military dictatorship into a more open democratic society. The idea was ultimately to have election, have a civilian government again. Uh, well, to do this, you needed the support of the population. To get the support of the population, you needed to continue to have high rates of economic growth. Now, if you have, if you have to pay so much for the import of oil, uh, 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 the question is, uh, can you afford to cut investments and cut down the rate of growth just to conform with the quadrupling of the price of oil? Well, there was an exit to this. There was a uh, 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 way to deal with this. The way to deal with this was that most of the oil exporters uh, 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 invested or placed huge sums of money, I'm talking about the Middle Eastern countries, into the international banks. And the international banks were flush with petrodollars. And they had to do something with petrodollars to earn uh, uh, some interest so they could pay their depositors, namely the Arabs. So uh, the, the, the international banks were looking around and see who can we finance. Well, there were, were countries like Brazil who, who wanted to continue uh, their growth uh, uh, and one way of continuing their growth was for somebody to lend them the money so they can pay for the additional cost of importing oil. Uh, so uh, the international banks in Brazil had one uh, thing in common. The banks had the money, the, uh, the Brazilians needed the money. Uh, and bingo, they began borrowing money. But it was, not, it was not only the oil importers who borrowed the money, but the exporters too, like Mexico. Mexico was swimming in oil. They had discovered huge oil deposits. Uh, and what did they do in the 1970s? Well, with the, uh, the rise of the price of oil from $5 to $12 to $20 to $30, today we laugh, $30 a barrel, you know, uh, 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 what did they say? Well, we want to drill for some more oil. That'll cost money. We want to build uh, refineries. That'll cost money. Well, no sweat. We go to those banks, we'll borrow money. And the banks say, oh, there's no problem, too. The collateral is there, the oil. Uh, the price of oil is rising. What's the problem? No problem. We'll borrow. So both the oil importers and the oil exporters were, were increasing dramatically uh, the money, amount of money they borrowed from the international banks. Uh, this continued throughout the 1970s. And by the time you get to the end of the 70s, early 80s, Something else happened to all these indebted countries. Uh, and I'm not just only talking about Brazil and Mexico, the same thing was true in Argentina. Well, what happened then was the United States felt that uh, inflation was getting out of hand. Uh, it was about 15% or whatever it was. And the Federal Reserve stepped in and, uh, and had very tight monetary policies. Tight monetary policies so that the prime rate in the United States shot up to 21 or more percent at the time. Well, most of the debt that was contracted by Latin America was a debt uh, uh, with flexible interest rates. You know, it's just like mortgages. You cannot get fixed or flexible. Problem is, when interest rates were low, many people got flexible at a very low rate, and now you can see what the problem is in the United States. Well, that was the problem with Latin America. Uh, they borrowed a huge amount of money uh, from the banks at fairly low interest rates, but then suddenly interest rates started rising. When our interest rates rose uh, and the prime rate went up to, uh, uh, to over 20%, uh, this caused the international rate to go up too. The international rate is called LIBOR, uh, uh, London Interbank Offered Rate. LIBOR is like the prime rate. Remember what the prime, well, for those of you who are students, the prime rate is if you're General Motors or Ford or General Electric, you borrow money at prime rate, you know, the, the lowest interest rate. If you're a small business person uh, in the upper uh, peninsula of, of Michigan and you only have 100 employees, you probably have to pay substantially more. You're not known, therefore you're at greater risk and you have to pay higher interest rates. Same thing internationally. Uh, if you're Germany and you want to borrow, no problem. You get the international interest rate called uh, LIBOR. If you're Brazil, well, you're more risky. Uh, you have to pay two or three uh, percentage points above LIBOR. Well, when interest rates started going up in the United States, they immediately lifted interest rates uh, in the rest of the world. And what happens to Brazil? What happens to Argentina, which had huge debts? Suddenly, the, the cost of the debt, all of these debt, uh, these money was borrowed on flexible interest rates, the cost of the debt was increasing dramatically to such an extent that by the early 1980s, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina had to borrow money just in order to meet their interest payments, not to invest anymore. Uh, and the whole thing got out of hand, and the net result of all this was that the, uh, uh, by the time you get to 1982, uh, the first country to declare bankruptcy or a moratorium, it's more polite, uh, was Mexico. And Mexico told the creditors we can't pay. And the creditor banks uh, said, okay, then uh, 
uh, do something about it. We might renegotiate the debt, but you've got to do it through the International Monetary Fund. They'll represent us. Uh, as soon as Mexico declared uh, a, a moratorium, uh, the markets closed for Latin America. Uh, Brazil couldn't borrow anymore. And it didn't, wasn't very long until Brazil had to declare a moratorium and the, uh, the, the creditor bank said, well, now go to the IMF. Uh, this was a very serious situation because the exposure of American banks to the Latin American debt was enormous. Uh, and it was feared that somehow, uh, uh, if nothing was done about it, there might be a severe banking crisis. Uh, even the threat was even more severe than the crisis that we're witnessing today. Uh, so the net result of all this, I'm skipping over history very fast, was that throughout the 1980s, uh, the Latin American co uh, countries had to uh, negotiate, renegotiate, turn over the debt, negotiate with the IMF, and the IMF made certain conditions. Uh, the, con uh, the conditions of, of, of tight monetary policy, the conditions of, uh, of governments substantially cutting their expenditures, uh, which resulted in substantial cut, uh, cutting of investment expenditures, especially uh, in, uh, in, uh, expenditures in infrastructure, in roads, in, in modernizing ports, and so on and so forth. The net result of all this was that throughout the 1980s, the rate of growth of Latin America was way down. Uh, many years of very high uh, unemployment, uh, uh, hardly any investment was taking place. Uh, the 1980s were called the lost decade. Uh, in addition to this, and I'm going to tell you the, uh, the reason for it, it'll take too long, but also as a result of the debt crisis, uh, the Latin American uh, uh, economies were forced to follow policies which were extremely inflationary. And gradually, especially in South America, the inflations ballooned because of the debt problem. Ballooned so that by the end of the 1980s, Argentina, Brazil had inflation rates of four to 5,000 percent a year. Uh, so that was the 1980s. By the end of the 1980s and by the early 1990s, with the pressure of the IMF, the pressure of, uh, to renegotiate the debt, uh, the, uh, the inflation explosion that you had, finally uh, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund uh, representing basically with the approval of the United States governments and Western European governments got their way with Latin Americans. That is to say uh, most Latin Americans were, uh, countries were forced to, uh, to uh, adopt uh, uh, very uh, conservative policies policies were, which were called neo, neoliberal policies. And what are the neoliberal policies which were demanded by the investment community and by the IMF, what did they consist of? Well, they consisted of, uh, 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 they forced them to try over and over again to, uh, uh, to deal with inflation, uh, to have special uh, uh, programs of uh, stabilization. Uh, the, uh, uh, it also consisted of uh, opening up the economy, uh, uh, the IMF insisted uh, you must uh, decrease uh, protection. You've had two or three decades of protection. Your industries are high cost industries. Your industries are, uh, 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 need to, uh, to, to face the fresh winds of international competition. Well, by the time you get to the 1990s, the, uh, they had no options. Most Latin American countries began to dismantle uh, the protection uh, tariffs, dismantle various types of uh, impediments to the importation of goods. Uh, the, uh, uh, the net result of, of all this was, uh, with this competition, was that imports began to rise again uh, from abroad, and uh, most firms, uh, both multinational firms operating in Latin America and domestic firms, had to substantially uh, uh, invest in more up-to-date technology, improving the quality of their products and improving the, the efficiency with which they were produced. Uh, the, uh, uh, also, what, the, uh, what occurred at that time, the neoliberal policies, was that uh, the, the West demanded, the, the creditors demanded, that all these state industries, uh, which were run often in a very corrupt and inefficient way, should be privatized. So you had a huge wave of privatization of, uh, uh, of all sorts of state enterprises. This was true in Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, all over the continent. Uh, the, uh, so in other words, the idea was to have an open economy uh, 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 facing the fresh winds of competition, decreasing the role of the state, and also part of it was to uh, facilitate the investment of, uh, 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 facilitate the, the possibility of foreigners to invest in certain sectors from which they had been excluded. 
Uh, so these were the sort of neoliberal policies that were instituted and followed from the 1990s on uh, throughout Latin America. The, uh, let me mention one other thing uh, uh, to, to consider, and that is uh, a characteristic of Latin America in the last 60 or 70 years. 60 or 70 years ago, 80% of the Latin American population was rural. Today, 80% of the population is urban, which means that in 60 or 70 years, you had a huge rural urban migration. Now that is a very interesting phenomenon and explains many of the problems of Latin America. And one of the great problems of Latin America, for example, is uh, how can you cope uh, in a, with a situation where there's such a tremendous structure in the distribution of the population in a fairly short period of time. Well, Latin America w was unable to cope with it adequately. And that is why typically when you, when you, when you read about, or maybe some of you have visited Latin America, you see everywhere you go, whether it's Rio de Janeiro, Buenos Aires, Lima, Peru, or Mexico City, they're, 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 they're huge, huge, proportion of the urban population live in slums. Uh, slums are called favelas, which are called uh, uh, pueblos jovenes, whatever. Anyway, that is a characteristic. Now, why has all this been taking place? Because very few societies, or maybe no society, can, know, uh, can adequately cope in terms of providing decent infrastructure, decent, decent housing, and so on, to a tremendously, uh, 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 rapidly rising, bulging uh, urban population. So that was one, that's a problem of the past and still exists today. And by the way, I talked to some people before lunch today or at lunchtime, uh, that is a problem that Asia is going to face in the future. Uh, because with all the burgeoning cities of Asia, be it Shanghai or, uh, or, uh, uh, or, uh, or, uh, or Calcutta or Bombay or Mumbai, as they call it now, uh, still India, over 50% of the population is still rural. Uh, same thing with China. Now, what is going to happen when there's going to be an exodus? That is the great fear of the Chinese. How can we keep them on the farm? How can we provide them enough, uh, uh, enough uh, employment in the cities without having, uh, and if we can't, uh, uh, how st stable will, will our society be? So it's amazing, relatively speaking, how stable Latin America was. But there's a basic problem that America, uh, Latin America faced in the past and still faces today. With all this industrialization that took place, the rate of job creation was minimal. The rate of growth of the urban population for many years was about twice as high as the rate of growth of the natural rate of growth of the country, which represents rural urban migration. But the rate of growth of jobs in the new industries was only about 2%, 2.5% 2 .2 a year. Uh, so in other words, the new industries which were promoted through import substitution simply were too capital intensive. And the big question then has been, what do you do with that population? Uh, when they leave the country. You can't tell them to go back to the farm. As a matter of fact, when you modernize agriculture, you, you're going to expulse more and more workers. Uh, well, if they can't find a job in the industrial sectors, what do they do? Well, they sell pencils in the streets. They sell lottery tickets in the streets. Uh, they go into the informal sector. Then uh, uh, another aspect, which is very important, a characteristic of Latin America, the dist and this goes back to colonial times, the distribution of income in Latin America is extremely concentrated. Uh, it's been so in, uh, in, in colonial times, when Latin America was dominated by large landowners, but it didn't change through industrialization. The industrialization benefited only a small proportion of the population because industry is very capital intensive uh, uh, compared to other types of activities. So the industrialization did not improve uh, the distribution of income. Uh, the, uh, so the people who were in the informal sector, because they f couldn't find jobs, their in uh, income was minimal as to the lucky ones who were, uh, who were uh, employed in industry. Uh, uh, now what is very also very interesting is that in the 19, uh, 1980s, when we forced Latin America to cut down on its expenditures, uh, uh, the governments to cut down their expenditures to balance their budget, when we forced Latin America to privatize, we did not improve the possibility of absorbing more labor. Because when you, uh, there's no doubt about the fact, that's another chapter, that many um, uh, industries, many uh, state firms, uh, for political uh, reasons, employed more people than they needed. And when privatization began to take place, the first thing that the new owners, the private owners did, was to dismiss hundreds of thousands of workers in order to become efficient. You can't expect, uh, uh, expect the private sector to be a, uh, a social organization that takes care of employing people they don't need. Uh, so privatization uh, uh, worsened. The opening up the economy, uh, 
uh, opening up for a, comp uh, a competition resulted in very interesting phenomenon, result in the fact that the multinationals who were already established there, or the domestic firms, to, to buy the latest technology. Because only with the latest technology could they effectively compete in the international market. But adopting the latest technology meant more automation. Uh, more automation means less jobs in industry. So, ironically, the privatization and the opening up of the economy worsened the distribution of income and worsened the dilemma of how do you effectively uh, employ that, uh, uh, the population. Uh, then, finally, uh, what, is ex uh, what, uh, what became uh, very, inter what's very interesting, I don't know to what extent it follows everything, but uh, uh, I'm adding more than I had written, but uh, <laughs> that's, um, that's the way it goes. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, what is very interesting is that the uh, Latin Amer many Latin American countries, especially in the last uh, 15 years, have tried to diversify their exports. Uh, try to export non-traditional goods so they could earn a foreign exchange to pay for imports. And how did they try to do this? Well, they tried to do this by giving tax incentives to firms. If you, uh, uh, if you export 30% uh, uh, of your cars, you get a reduction of what you earn, the money you earn from the exportation. You pay less corporate income taxes or less. Uh, if you, uh, uh, and in addition to this, uh, the state development banks uh, would give uh, subsidized credits uh, to firms that exported. Uh, now, what is very interesting is that and Brazil and uh, Mexico uh, succeeded in penetrating the market, uh, in competing. They even exported some automobiles uh, from Brazil. That is not, not the Brazilians, but rather the multinational Ford, producing Fords in Brazil or Mexico, re-exporting them to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the U.S. market. Uh, the, uh, uh, but the problem that arose then is was, uh, especially in the steel industry, for example, uh, is that many American producers uh, would complain. And they say, wait, we all belong to GATT, which is now called WTO, the World Trade Organization. And it's against uh, the rule of dumping product. Dumping means selling a product below cost abroad or at a lower price than you uh, uh, sell it domestically. Uh, uh, if that can be proven, then you can retaliate against them. Well, all sorts of lawsuits were started in the United States, saying uh, the Latin Americans, by using uh, tax incentives, by using uh, subsidized credits, they're really undermining uh, 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 the United States. They're dumping their product of the United States. And these problems haven't been solved yet. It's a, a field day for lawyers on one side or the other. Is subsidized credit, uh, is uh, 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 tax incentive, is that dumping or isn't it dumping? I suppose if you're a good lawyer, you can make a case for both sides, depending who pays more money. Uh, but uh, so, uh, uh, the, uh, so these were all part of the, uh, uh, the problems that have arisen uh, with the, uh, 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 have, have arisen with the uh, globalization, let us say, of the Latin American economies. They globalized uh, in, uh, in, in a world context in the sense that they opened up. It was easier to invest there. It was easier to import goods there. Uh, 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 but the question was, d did this globalization, how, to what extent does it benefit them? Uh, to what extent does it solve some of their traditional problems, like income distribution, or to what extent does it worsen it? Now, before I go on, I'm going to make a few uh, generalizations in the last 10 minutes of my lecture. But before I do this, uh, and I'll make some provocation, because I'm going to make some, at least one or two statements that only applies not only to Latin America, but also to the United States. I thought I'd like to show you just a few uh, uh, tables. Uh, let me just show you uh, the tables. And then uh, if you remember what the table says, I want to mention a few things. First of all, here you have the leading exporters uh, uh, in world merchandise trade in, in 2006. After the Second World War, the United States, 21% uh, uh, or 22% of world exports were US exports. We dominated uh, the market. It was down uh, to 8.6% in uh, 2006, and we were not the number one exporter anymore. It was Germany with 9.2% uh, uh, of the market. Then you can see you know, China in 2006, 8%, Japan, less than China, uh, France, and so on. And here are some of the major Latin American countries, their participation in world exports, 2.1% for Mexico, Brazil 1.1%, Chile 0.5%. Then I have the leading importers uh, in world merchandise trade, 
there were the leaders. Uh, that explains a little bit our traditional trade deficit. You know, only 8% or 0.6% of world exports, but 15.5% of world imports. Uh, and Germany uh, behind us, 7.3%, and China, 5.4%, uh, et cetera. And down there you see Mexico, uh, Chile, and Argentina. Uh, the next table, we have uh, world mer This is uh, uh, over time. And as you can see here, world merchandise exports, U.S., share 1948 was almost 22 percent went down to 12 percent and down to 8.8 percent .8%, although slightly less according to the, uh, the figs are not exactly comparable to the previous table uh south america and central america uh their share declined dramatically 2006 only 3.6 percent germany rose well war destroyed germany and they recovered went up from 1.4 to 9.4 percent look at china 1948 less than one percent uh, 2006, 8.2%. That's a well, look at 73. China was only 1%. And look at the dramatic increase in their share of world exports. Uh, merchandise imports, well, you can see the, uh, the U.S. held its share. Uh, our appetite didn't decrease. And, uh, and the Chinese uh, increased their share, but certainly not by as much as their exports. Uh, then I have here... Uh, well, leading export, I don't want to talk too much about this, of commercial services. Nowadays, we, don't, we, we should think not only of the exports of goods, but also of services, which is very important to the U.S. Uh, we're the number one exporter of services in 2006, followed by the United Kingdom. Uh, this is partially insurance, uh, financial services, in which we still have a substantial comparative advantage, and so do the British. Uh, here you have the next one. Are, we, are you still with me? Yes. Uh, world major exports by product groups. Uh, very interesting. The world. 78% of exports consist of manufacturers. 19% uh, of, of fuels and mining products. And 8% agriculture. This is for the world as a whole. North America, 77% uh, uh, of exports are manufacturers. 13% uh, fuels and uh, of mineral products. And 9% agriculture. Uh, uh, Latin America uh, manufactures only 33.8%. Uh, mining that's been rising lately is 42%. And keep this in mind. And then uh, agriculture, 23%. Europe, 80% 80, 80 is manufactures. Uh, only 8.8% is. Uh, uh, and Asia, as you can see, 84% uh, is manufactures, their exports. Uh, fuels and uh, mining products, 10% and 5.5% for agriculture. Uh, Africa, very interesting. Uh, remember this, 68% is in fuel, uh, basically. Uh, destination of exports, just to orient yourself. This is uh, for year 2000 and 2006. Uh, uh, United, this is the United States. So the United States destination of exports is 38% uh, 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 was to North America, is to uh, uh, basically uh, 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 Mexico and uh, Canada, and 32% in uh, 2006. South America, uh, the United States, uh, it's only 7.5 and 6.6%. It's gone down. Uh, Asia, 26% uh, and 22%. Uh, China, uh, uh, the United States export to China is 1.9 versus 3.5%. Now look at China's uh, uh, export structure, geographic export structure. China uh, uh, to North America, basically the United States, exports 31, uh, between 32 and now it's 30% of its exports. Piddling amount to, uh, uh, to Central America. Most of, uh, uh, to Europe, it's 21 and 25%. Uh, to Japan, it's 15 and 30%, and to other Asian countries, it's about uh, 32%. Uh, the United States, origin of imports, uh, they mainly come from Canada and, and, uh, uh, and Mexico. Uh, uh, South uh, and Central America, it's very little. Uh, uh, China, uh, that goes up. The origin of imports in, in 2000 was 10%. 0.7%, now it's 21.7%. It's probably even higher for the last two years. Uh, and Japan's gone down. Japan used to be one of our leading customers, uh, or, or leading suppliers, let's say. But possibly it's went down because they've, uh, they've uh, invested more in, uh, in factories in the United States. 
So they're producing here with a weak dollar. It's cheaper to produce here rather than to export it from Japan. And here is China. Uh, China, uh, uh, this is again origin of imports of China uh, from North America. It's down to 8.8%. And look, uh, for, for, uh, not for China, 73% of their imports come from other Asian countries. And we would like them to import more from us uh, to take care of the trade deficit. Uh, just some miscellaneous data, and then I want to come to my provocations. Uh, uh, again, uh, let me just mention this and then put this into a, a general context. China, the average uh, in China, the average yearly growth rate of labor productivity in core manufacturing between 2003 and 2006 was 21%, 20% a year productivity growth. Uh, China, the ratio of labor cost to gross output and current prices in core manufacturing went down from 10% to 6.3%. Here is uh, uh, yearly labor productivity growth rates in manufacturing between 1980 and 2001. Germany, the yearly uh, uh, growth rate was two point uh, productivity of labor. Germany, in those uh, 20 years, it went up by 2.4% a year. The US, UK, 3.7. Japan, 2.9. US, 3.6. Brazil, 0 0.8. China, 6.7%. The rate of growth of productivity, output per hour. Finally, just one more page of numbers, and then I'll get back to the, my arguments. The medium hourly wage in the United States, uh, this is about two years ago, uh, was $15, the medium. Medium hourly wage in China, in US dollars, 53 cents. Uh, the average hourly compensation cost in 2002, if you take the US and an index number as 100, for China it was three. For Brazil it was 12. Mexico 12, European Union 94, and Japan 88. Uh, this is just the average hour compensation, U.S. 100, and you can see uh, 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 the China situation and, uh, and the Latin American situation. Now, uh, let me get back to the... Uh, I've got to find out where, I, where my notes are. There they are. Uh, now, as already mentioned, uh, the, uh, the efforts by Latin America to uh, export non-traditional goods uh, to the United States have run into, uh, into a barrier. They do so, but uh, it's very hard for them to, uh, uh, to cross uh, the barrier. Uh, but what is very interesting is that uh, 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 when you look at Lat Latin America, is that, and I must have, don't know if I had those, well, you have to rely on my, what I'm saying, a large proportion, what's very interesting, a large proportion of Latin America's exports now are still primary products in spite of uh, industrialization. Uh, uh, over 60% of Chile's exports are basically copper. Uh, over 70% uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Argentinian exports are uh, beef and, and, and grain uh, products and soybeans and so on and so forth. Uh, the, uh, so what is, what, what's been happening in, uh, in, in Latin America is that, the, uh, 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 that you've had a substantial increase, once again, in the growth rate of their economies in the last uh, seven or eight years. But most of that growth has been based on the exportation, not of manufactured goods, but rather of primary goods. In other words, what is, in, and why is this? Uh, uh, why has this contributed to the growth of Latin America? Well, basically because of the, Ch of the China syndrome. Uh, China has been growing for over 10% uh, a year for the last 15 years. Uh, China is the one uh, that demands huge amounts of, uh, of, of primary products, of both m uh, minerals and food, for its booming economy to function. And the prices of uh, raw materials, or most commodities, have been increasing basically because of China. And because of China, the, uh, the trade situation of Latin America has improved substantially. Not because they more easily can sell their manufactured products, but rather because of the, uh, uh, their exportation of soybeans, of iron ore, of um, uh, manganese, and so on and so forth, to satisfy the hunger, so to speak, of China in their rapid industrialization process. So that's sort of an irony, because the idea at first was let's get away 
uh, from earning foreign exchange through the exportation of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, primary products. That's why you had import substitution industrialization. But now with all that industry, what is happening? Is the industry helping them? No, what's helping them is uh, the exportation of, uh, of, of primary products. Back, so to speak, where you came from. Back to the future, so to speak. And the big question that Latin Americans ask themselves, how long can this go on? Uh, uh, once again, you have a center periphery, uh, the, and I didn't mention this in my lecture, uh, the justification for much of the industrialization of Latin America was based on the center periphery analysis, the analysis of the Economic Commission of Latin America that says the old center periphery, in which the, the center was the industrial centers of the world, the periphery was Latin America and Asia, that worked against uh, those economies. The whole uh, justification for industrialization was based on uh, the declining uh, relative price ratio, terms of trade, as we call it, of Latin America. But now, our irony of irony, what is happening to Latin America is that, once again, uh, uh, their success, quote unquote, uh, or their future success for economic growth depends on what? On the exportation of primary products. And what is very, except now the center is not Europe or the United States, the center is China. Uh, and the center also is China for, uh, for, uh, uh, for the United States. Uh, so in other words, the, uh, 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 not for, uh, uh, I want to mention one more item. Huge amount, as you know, of, of investments by China have taken place in, in, in Africa. Africa has a huge amount of China, what? To exploit the mines. To exploit the mines, they're even building railroads, uh, to take the mining products from the interior of uh, Africa to the port cities and out to China. So China is repeating what happened in the 19th century, except that it now is not the periphery, it is the center, and the periphery is Africa and maybe Latin America. Uh, let me now close. Uh, uh, I have many more topics on, down on my outline that I want to mention. But let me close on uh, my major prov uh, provocation, and that applies to the United States and to Latin America and to China. Uh, the, uh, uh, you've, got this, you've got the problem of the United States running a trade deficit, gigantic trade deficit, continuously with China, China having accumulated a uh, few trillion dollars worth, or over trillion dollars worth of foreign exchange reserves. The, China is now the main creditor of the U.S. government. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Latin America uh, is dependent on the exportation of its traditional products uh, in that new ch China-dominated world economy. What do you do about it? Uh, now, what is very interesting is when I teach a course on international economics, at the end, at one point of the course, I talk about tariffs, the theory of tariffs. And then I talk about what are the arguments for tariffs. And we economists as a profession are free traders. We don't, we hate tariffs, supposedly. Um, well, we give various arguments. And one argument which we, uh, which we give is, well, some people, especially the unions here, say we need a tariff to protect the high standard of living, living of the American worker. We're, giving, we're paying a huge wage, remember, $15 an hour uh, to the American worker. And uh, if we engage in free trade, well, uh, we're going to be overwhelmed by uh, Chinese and Mexican products whose workers are being paid a piddling sum. Uh, that is the justification to which we economists, in a very sanctimonious, self-righteous way, say, listen, sure, we might make uh, our workers 10 times as much as the Mexican workers, but the productivity of the American workers 15 times as high. So that doesn't really matter if they get paid slave wages. That was the traditional product, and then we left it at the end, and we showed them how superior our logical thinking is in economics. But what happens with globalization? What happens with globalization is that a huge amount of technology has now been transferred to places like China. And the productivity of the Chinese work has arisen tremendously. Remember the statistics I showed you. On the other hand, the wage of the Chinese work has hardly changed. Remember the tiny fraction it is of the wage that we're paying. So they now, now you cannot argue anymore that they're paying very little, but their productivity is so much lower than our productivity. It seems, according to the productivity figure that I've shown you, that uh, they're catching up very fast if they haven't caught up already. Then a big dilemma poses itself, and that's the same thing for Latin America when they're trying to export manufactured goods. The dilemma is the following. How do we remedy the situation? Can we uh, uh, propose to the Chinese to dramatically increase the standard of living and the wages of the Chinese worker? And if the Chinese refuse to do it, then maybe we have to decrease the standard of living of our workers. And to a certain extent, this is already happening. 
I mean, the unions here are still there, but they're very weak in their bargaining position. Uh, so the question is, what do you do about it? Are you going to remain a free trader? Or are you going to make a, some sort of a, uh, an accommodation, uh, a division of the spoils uh, with the Chinese? The Chinese accepting uh, that maybe they have to do something to improve uh, the living standard of their masses. And the same thing, same arguments you can find in Brazil. The Brazilian uh, shoe industry, the Brazilian textile industry,